All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to our B5 session titled Rock Bottom. We are very excited to get uh, be able to share this with you. Uh, my name is Ryan Beckley. I am the AmeriCorps Vista with the Mayor's Office of Housing here in Honolulu. And basically a little bit about me, uh, I've been in this position for about a year now. I'm really excited to be able to work with housing in general, but like the homeless community and learning more about how we can help to solve the issues surrounding homelessness. I'll let Asher share a little bit more about himself. Hi, uh, good morning. And my name is Asher, and I just completed my undergrad um, in business management at Shiloh College of Business at UH Manoa. And I was an intern for city and county in Honolulu. Um, I was a Pokela intern this past um, January to March, uh, sorry, to May. And then um, I basically were hired as an intern for the Office of Housing. And when I was coming into this internship, or actually when I applied, I wasn't really sure where I was gonna get placed into. And when I got placed into, I had no idea what homelessness uh, sector of Office of Housing, the Mayor's Office do. And our director, Mike Alexander, he was at the interview when I was getting interviewed for the internship. And he knew that I was an entrepreneur. So he asked me, so Asher, what do you think we can do as our department to help communicate and connect the community and the homelessness? So I quickly responded. Um, I pitched an idea of how community can gain more understanding and awareness towards the homelessness by maybe creating an informal documentary series by utilizing social media platforms to empower communities to help each other and from a pub public perspective, it is quick to say homelessness is the government's fault, or it could be the one person's fault. But what public don't understand is the amount of work that might put into in homelessness. And it isn't just a government's job. It isn't just service workers' job. It is a collaborative energy that we as community also have to take extra miles to help each other. And it was also because I was a normal person before I came into this internship. I didn't really know anything about city and county. I didn't really have an intention of working at city and county. However, that is the reason why I understand how homelessness are being treated in our community. And I noticed that so much, so many people, it's not just some people, so many people have something to say about homelessness with a very ignorant standpoint. And a lot of people say a lot of negative stuff about homelessness. And you have every reason to feel that way. However, those stigmas does stay in the society where People would say derogative words, um, very insulting type of words. Um, when you come into, ask yourself, do you feel comfortable people telling you all these madness and all these negative words being attacked every day you pass by somebody? How do you feel? How do you feel as a person being told that every single day. And this is a hard question because I feel like a lot of people don't try to see it in someone else's shoes. It's because that is what the stigma is. That is what stereotype is. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what they're live, how they're living. And that's where this pitch came. And I said, why don't we make an informal documentary because a government is making a documentary series, like a vice. No government ever done it before. I've never seen any government ent entities doing this. And 
I think it would be a really controversial and bold move for us in Hawaii and city and county of Honolulu to be the first government entity that would release a bold documentary statement. So that's where this idea came from. Um, by showcasing the story in the community's eye level, which you guys will see in a minute, it'll allow the community to feel empowered and maybe you can try brainstorm what you can do in your own community and we can figure this out together. And homeless people are not to be fixed, but to be healed. And when I was doing this internship, I felt healed. I felt so good about myself. I never felt any like type of this feeling before. And I think it's because it makes you feel good to help people and you can feel it. And you don't have to be a government worker. You don't have to be a service provider to do this. So that's where the intention came. And this is basically a film that will show you and express that government sees you. And that is rock bottom. Okay, so the title, as you see, is Rock Bottom. And so it's titled Rock Bottom because to many homeless people, it is rock bottom where they hit before they decide or become to the realization that, you know, they have nowhere to go but up. And so in this first episode, uh, we really wanted to kind of create this metaphorical window. And we wanted to really wipe the window as clear as possible so that people could really get a very in-depth view on what homelessness is. And so we, we approached many people in the community to try to uh, represent that for you guys. And so without further ado, uh, episode one of Rock Bottom. People complain and the city cleans up. It's a seemingly never-ending cycle when dealing with Hawaii's homeless. Good evening, I'm Kenny Choi. And I'm Yenji Denise. By tomorrow morning, one of Oahu's most notorious homeless hangouts will be cleaned up. So why are people saying it's just a waste of time? Well, you don't have to look far to find Hawaii's homeless population. But what may surprise you is that some come to the islands planning on being homeless. The number of Oahu homeless living on the streets has reached the highest number in a decade. The mayor is now urging the homeless to stay in shelter so they can better their chances of finding more permanent housing. Can hang around because yeah. you know, there's community concerns so everybody can come up and share their mana. So. Mahalo. Keep arresting them until somehow it, they're locked up or what have you. But as far as HPD's role, we're just as frustrated as the community. And you guys are well familiar with him. What can we do to get him the help he needs? One look at the Kapalama Canal is all you need to see why so many people around here complain. Hey, how about just no camping, no tents? He's even created a website to document the issue and offer solutions. Based on my observations, it's the morning of that second day uh, when I'm coming in, you know, right before 8 o'clock. There'll be like a parade of shopping carts where everyone has already packed up their tents. I am an immigrant to this country. My husband and I, you know, have just been around the downtown Chinatown area for, um, as residents and, you know, worked in the area for, gosh, almost two decades now. 
homelessness in the downtown channel, uh, Chinatown area is different from homelessness in other areas. But it seems like in the downtown Chinatown area, uh, the homeless population are more single uh, people and they just live by themselves. And the streets are not as clean as they used to be. Um, it's just, we, we can't have trash littered everywhere. And so, but when it's completely transient, um, it, that's, it's just really hard. And you know, people don't want to come to the Chinatown area. And now we have, you know, the COVID-19 scare and it's just, it's just making it worse. You know, I've been hearing that businesses are, are, um, are on the knife's edge, you know, and so it's just, it's, you know, it's bad. <laughs> I came here for one reason, to tell somebody, hey, they trying to take us into hardship because they trying to raise some, some non-profit rent. And ain't nobody giving us no donations or nothing because don't nobody want to come down to Chinatown with people laying around there smoking crap, peeing all over the sidewalk and pooping all over the sidewalk and putting up tents. Don't nobody want to come down there. I can't get nobody coming to my ministry to try to help or nothing. They tell me I ain't going down to Chinatown. Welcome to the uh, Harry Passlot building. Okay. My name is Mark Bernstein. And I have been here in this building for 40 years now, since 1979. That vault over there is the uh, first vault. Homelessness in Honolulu, in downtown, in old downtown Honolulu, which you now wish to call Chinatown, has changed. And when it was a economically driven phenomenon, the people who were here in downtown Honolulu who were homeless were people we would see every day. And they would sit on the various benches around town. And some of us gave them money on a regular basis, some of us gave them food on a regular basis. Some of us gave them uh, clothing on a regular basis. And so they were very much a part of the community. They were our homeless. I'll record this mic. Oh, hey, come on in. My name is Mike Boschman, and I am a uh, long-time well, born and raised resident here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, I manage this condo, Harbor Court. It's a condominium and located right in the heart of downtown. And uh, it was built in 1994. I've been here for 15 years. And so, um, to me, the public perception of homelessness is it's bad, it's getting worse. You know, there are things going on. Uh, that are, are, are helping a lot with the homelessness. And I think the public needs to know that rather than just thinking that HPD is responsible for all of this. What's available for these people? Is there something that, is there an organization out there that can come help versus just saying, call the police? The police are very busy and they're trying to do what they can. Um, I think certainly um, calling the police on people uh, is not the way to go because what are you going to do with them? We, locking them up, what, what good does that do? You know, we don't have uh, enough prison facilities. You take them in, then they come out, and it's just worse. They're not going to get treatment in prison. They're going to be abused. It's just, it's just worse. So, um, you know, when I see uh, people who are severely distressed on the on the streets, I don't, I don't call police. It, it doesn't do anything. Um, I want to call social services, but there are really not enough social services to go around. There are not enough treatment beds to go around, and, and really, they, people need treatment. Okay, welcome back, everybody. So that was episode one, and... Uh, I know that when we started filming episode one or before we started filming episode one, um, there were a lot of questions being asked about 
you know, what can be done? A lot of people had no idea. They were just, uh, you know, they, they thought that maybe you call the police or, uh, I don't know, you, you, you do your best to, to, to get them out of, you know, your sight or you, you feed them. They, they didn't necessarily know what to do. They just had a lot of different opinions on what, what that was or what they could do. And so this really kind of stems from a meeting that we had with a few of the people who actually were in the episode to try to kind of come up with a collective. And I think we did that. And we started to dig a little bit deeper within our research when we started filming. And that's ultimately how we kind of came to the conclusion on how we wanted to frame episode one. And so moving into episode two, we wanted to kind of paint a picture on what homelessness was. We got the community's take on what they felt about homelessness in their community and how it was affecting them. And so we wanted to kind of turn it, the camera around and showcase exactly what homelessness was from the homelessness standpoint. Did you want to say anything about it before we uh, loaded up episode two, Asher? Okay, so thank you, Ryan. Um, so yeah, um, episode one, definitely, it was a collective of messages from everyone. And for episode two, I think a lot of you guys are probably wondering, okay, so I thought this is a homelessness video, homelessness documentary. And this is where you'll start seeing a lot more and you'll start to see um, a lot more emotions to it and their thoughts and stuff like that and um i want you guys to pay attention a lot on their faces or the way they talk or just their personality in general i want you guys to see them and cheer them out um but yeah that's all i have to say for uh episode two That's why, I don't know, but that's what I was saying. You see that part where they piss on and they get, and get the pot. Because they're gay. You know what I mean? We kind of figure out this kind of stuff. That's, that's right? part of the boys too. You know what I mean? I mean, you see, before I used to see spam, damn, everybody on the beach. Exactly. You don't see spam on the beach no more. They only needed like $1,700 a month. Everything's changed. It's, it's changed, and honestly, it's just... Got for clothes on. Yeah. No, I hear you, bro. I hear you, and I, I wish I had the right answers. I don't. You know what I mean? But the thing is, you, you have a concern. Let the boys take care of that car. Let the locals. Cause I don't want to see that guy too, but I bet you I guarantee you you're an old timer. Because that's, and I understand why, because you want to feel safe. How can you sort of avoid any potential problems with HPV? Because I don't think anybody wants to get, you know, 21 days if their documents are with all their stuff, it gets seized. If they, you know, they have to go wait and they don't have any ID, they don't have any money, they don't have anything they had with them. And you gotta go all the way to IA in the middle of the night to go get all your stuff back. How can we avoid getting into those situations where it's someone who's been there for a long time, constantly trying to get on their feet, but every time they get up a little bit, they get too tough of each. So how can we work together with HPD and the sweeps to let HPD do their job? but also let, help people to get right. more where they're trying to go. Okay, nuanced questions, many layers. I'm gonna ask HPD to respond to what they can. The other might be Mr. Alexander as far as city. The parks close from 10 p.m. to five in the morning. So if anybody is in the park during those hours, it is a violation at first, they get written a, a citation. And if, uh, say you come back the next day and the same individuals are in the park, then it is an arrestable offense. The process for us on our HPD side, as far as when we do an SPO, we give them the 24 hour notice the day before to let them know that the sweep is gonna occur. And then we come out the next day with our outreach as well. And we ask them, you know, if you're interested in shelter. We cannot force individuals to go into shelter. We understand that they live out here in Waianae and they, a lot of their doctors are here in Waianae, but the shelters in Waianae are full. So whenever they get, it's kind of a first come first serve thing. Whatever pops up first, like say IHS, they don't want to go down into town they, because I understand they got their medical staff and whatnot out here. They have their appointments out here. So then they end up turning down the shelter that is offered to them. So we're working in the process on trying to get more people into the shelters that are out here in Waianae, but 
if it's full, we, we cannot really control that as HPDA on our side. My wife passed away five years ago. Um, diabetic heart attack. So I, I was staying at next step with her. That's where she died. And when they found out she died, three days after she passed, Jason, the guy that runs the place, came to me and threw me out on the street. I said, what good to do? make me homeless because she passed away. They said, well, your share of the rent was coming out of her disability check. And now that you're not employed and have no way to pay the rent, you got to go. So they sent me to the street. I've been here five years, three months, journey back home to the mainland. I had an airline ticket sent to me from my former boss. And I called the airport and they said, yeah, that ticket's here, it's got your name all over it. All you gotta do is claim it, show a picture ID. Two days after I made that call, somebody stole my wallet. Social security card, driver's license, birth certificate. Like I said, I just gotta clean up this big pile and try to sift my way through it. I'm gonna put a towel. I have a mom and a grandmother. It's okay, I'm sorry. Thank you for sharing, we really appreciate it. So, I can't. So I got into the situation. I was suspended without pay. It made me and my family homeless. Uh, my kids suffered immensely from that, you know, the stigma of being homeless. And it really hurt me, and to this day, they still hate me. Eventually, they got to go live with relatives, but I remained homeless. And uh, one day when we were camping at Bellows, a tree fell on me and cut my face. And uh, one of the signs of cancer is a cut that never heals. So it never healed and it got bigger. Because my life was in so much turmoil, I decided that's the way I want to die. Eventually, um, it, it got larger and went onto my nose. Hopefully, I can get housing not, I don't feel like going on anymore. I feel like I, I will just refuse any medical treatment and die because I'm tired, I'm sick and tired. Okay, welcome back again. That was episode two. And again, we really wanted to just allow you guys to peer into what homelessness is and get a little glimpse of some of the things or some of the issues surrounding homelessness that aren't directly uh, being within a house. You know, I think we got a chance to see physical, physical health, um, mental health, family instability. And um, around the time that we were filming uh, episode two, uh, we ran into a new roadblock and that was COVID-19, and we were able to uh, kind of see how this affected not just the homeless community, but affecting all of our own lives. And that's what brings me to episode three, because we're all affected, and we're all, we all have a hand in this, right? And I think that episode three really uh, illustrates this, uh, because homelessness 
you know, anybody could be homeless. Anybody could be depressed. Anybody could be in a situation where they could even help someone who is homeless or needs help before they end up homeless. And so episode three is all about the action that can be taken. Ashley, did you want to say anything before we start episode three? Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Um, just kind of adding on to that, definitely the statement of anybody can be homeless um, is very, very true, very, very real. I was one of those people who almost experienced that before, and I've seen other people around me also experience that before, and I see some people end up on the street going in and out of jail, and very, very difficult situation. I think that it's not just you think that you're not going to get put into that situation. You absolutely have no idea. I absolutely have no idea. Nobody has absolutely no idea when that can happen to you, when life just gets taken away from you. And that's the thing is that you can be homeless at any point in time. And yeah, like part three was a very heartwarming episode for me and Ryan. And I hope you guys can feel the same. Let's get right in. Perfect time to connect to the community. That's why the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, will be there. We're learning more about NAMI today and about the programs they offer. Joining me now, Executive Director Kumi McDonald. We see oftentimes stage four, which is people on the streets oftentimes, mm. but there's many people who are stage one or two that are struggling and suffering in silence. And so we want to bring that out into the open and saying that it affects one in five of us. Hi, I'm Kumi McDonald. I am the Executive Director of NAMI Hawaii. NAMI Hawaii is a national alliance on mental illness, and we bring support, education, advocacy, and awareness for individuals and families affected by mental illness. I'm Anissa Wiseman. I am the Program Director and Walk Manager at NAMI Hawaii. My mom, she is diagnosed um, bipolar disorder with severe psychosis. Um, and that's how I found NAMI. I had an interaction with my mom. She was living homeless on the beach in Mokalia. I didn't know what to do anymore. I went home, I did a Google search, didn't know what I was looking for, and I found NAMI. And I started attending their support groups where I found group wisdom, which is very, very valuable, and just the support and knowing that I'm not alone in this was also very helpful too. So I was struggling on and off with mental health issues as a youngster all my life. Somehow I didn't understand it. I wasn't able to get help when I needed. As a child, I remember asking my mother, please help me, I'm struggling with anxiety and depression, and she didn't know how to help me. Fast forward, now I'm a mom, and my son, who was a college student, became severely depressed in his junior year at UH, and became, um, you know, stuck in his room, and just so suicidal and so very depressed, and it made me want to do something to help people like me and like my son. Mental illness is an illness. It's not someone who's being lazy or who's being irrational. It's an actual illness of the brain and moods and you, your thought processes are interrupted and you're not thinking clearly. It affects your body. So it's not just your mind, but it also affects your body, your relationships, and your ability to cope in society. Here's a question for you. If you were going to invest now in your future self, what would you focus on? One of the world's longest health studies sought to find the answer to that question. Their lives gave researchers evidence that our relationships with others keep us happy and healthy. Dr. Robert Waldinger is a fourth director of the study, which continues tracking the roughly 60 surviving members. Good morning to you. Good morning. You know, there's a great quote, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to get the author right, but the, it was about that the way we judge a society is by how they treat their most vulnerable people. And the homeless are among the most vulnerable people on the planet. And she put out her hand to him and said, Daddy, Daddy, wait, I'm on a call. <laughs> Many homeless people um, 
are alienated and frightened, particularly if people suffer from mental illness and if they suffer from addiction, as many homeless people do. Finding ways to connect with them in non-shaming ways and hearing what they feel they need is really important. We want them to fit into the systems we create for them and that's understandable, but sometimes we just, we really need to listen to what their concerns are and we really need to make it, make them feel safe enough to get treatment, particularly if they're suffering from mental illness. The question is how do we make it safe for them? How do we listen to them and gain their trust and then make it safe enough for them to come for treatment? And when we treat mental illness, people are more likely to be able to stay in housing and to fulfill other kinds of obligations. The strongest predictor of how people were going to grow old was how satisfied they were in their relationships with other people. So many people just ignore homeless people. Like you just walk down the street and you ignore them. For a homeless person, you start to feel ignored and maybe you start to internalize that a bit. I mean, if you have the same message getting put into your brain every single day and like affirmed by every single person that you interact with, eventually you will start to believe those things about yourself and it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy with no way out. For me, if I was homeless and so many people kept ignoring me, I feel like I would have to have some resiliency. Oh. I did. We, we sit here about. I got on the wedding. We've been there like five times. And I had uh, to right. relocate. They said this is how it works. Hey, you heard about that? You they heard that buddy guy? My baby don't do what my daddy we don't pay. want we have to say. To take it. You got it. Like post it up. 300 something like that. Okay, check it out. I love IHS. Give me the post I love all. I'm going to take it on one side. I'm going to see no trouble. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Just being responsible, us. paying your bills, working a job, a room, paying your bills, and um, none of this stuff. <laughs> Taking care of yourself. Hey, dude, just cranking on the North Shore, man. Big waves only. Yeah, I would like to go to college, but I can't afford it. Wait a minute, I'm a good person. Oh yeah. Just because I'm a victim of circumstance. Doesn't make me a bad person. Good to know that people yes. actually care. Of course. Yeah, I know you. I'm in recovery from PTSD, anxiety, and depression myself. Um, so that's what I strive for to be able to recognize my feelings, communicate them, and then regulate them as well. But some people on the other uh, other side will say, let's not call it a mental illness, let's call it a mental health condition or a lived experience, because every human experiences some type of a mental health issue. Every human. Like, I even have a hard time because it's because of stigma, like, I understand the fact that we need to call it a mental illness so that people look at it that way, but then uh, it also feels like a duality because are we further stigmatizing it by calling it? When I am able to answer the phone to another family member in crisis and I am able to share my experience, even when sometimes I don't feel like I'm able to give them a clear cutthroat answer, I'm only able to share with them through my own experience of like my experience of what happens when a family member um, goes to Castle and, and you know all of those things. When I'm able to share and even though I feel like it's nothing that I'm sharing, to them, it's it's so much. It's I, they're finally getting an answer, even if it isn't what they wanted to hear. It's it still is something, and it, it it gives me value, and it makes me feel like I went through what I went through for a reason, so that I can continue to help and support other people through it as well. It's about giving families hope, and when I come and give advice or share something, they don't listen. But then when I say, "Look, I'm a mom." My son had suicidal depression. I, I get it, I, I'm not, I don't understand everything you're going through, but I get it. Then they go, tell me more, and they're willing to listen. And then when I said, 
now these are the steps that we took. This is what NAMI did. This is the programs that I've been through, education classes I've taken, and it's helped change my son's life, my life. It gives them hope, and that is what we're about. We're about giving families and individuals hope that there is hope for recovery and a better life. Okay, welcome back for a final time. Uh, that was episode three, and we began to see how we can take action, uh, not necessarily just uh, to try to end or solve our homelessness uh, problems, but also to be able to solve some of our own problems uh, if we're experiencing some type of uh, depression. If, we're, if, if our family members are experiencing some type of um, homelessness or lived experience or mental health condition, uh, we, we see the resources that are available for us, right? And we also see um, what we can do. Um, Ashley, did you want to say anything about that? Okay. Um, so... If anyone is in here is wondering, okay, so what is this exactly you? Um, the answer is, it is up to you. It is up to you whether what you want to do with this, up to you whether you want to show it to somebody else who's being ignorant, maybe show it to them, hey, maybe you should watch this. Um, you don't need to be inspired by watching this video. We're not asking you to be inspired. We're just asking you to just watch it and then see if you have any thoughts. Maybe you might feel differently. Maybe you don't. Um, it is not our job to force you to help people. It isn't, that is not our liberty. So what we made can hopefully reach to some people and the people that were shown can show it to other people and spread a message normal these ideas normalize trying to reach out to people try to help each other and bringing back a lot of spirit ohana spirit and um these are very essential foundation as oahu residents and for locals here so you know yeah i hope um you guys can totally ask questions but before we do our q and a I did post um, the link for episode one, two, three. Um, it is on our um, Honolulu um, CNC Office of Housing YouTube channel, official YouTube channel. This is the government run YouTube channel, and it is verified channel. Um, and we posted the link on the chat and as well as the Q&A section. Um, if you guys don't know how to open up the chat, Press chat on the right bottom um, area of the WebEx call, and you will able to see the links with, along with the title. So that's where you guys can find it. And uh, we also upload different types of video, not just uh, rock bottom series, but like a small episode. Um, we, me and Ryan, we did about uh, key quick. Uh, if you guys don't, if you guys know what that is, and if you guys don't, it it was uh, basically um, COVID. Um, basically, like COVID trained uh, homeless shelter, um, and this it was built very very recently, just past uh, May or so. Um, very new project, and then um, been doing a fantastic job over there. So um, we do all kinds of things together, and um, we have a lot of fun and a lot of, I guess, healing. And it was beautiful, most beautiful thing I personally every day in my entire life. So yeah, if you guys want to watch our YouTube channel, um, the links are there. So now um, I think we can open up for Q&A um, sec section. Um, Ryan, what do you think? Sure. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open up the Q&A session. 
Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and put your questions into uh, the Q&A section. Uh, and we'll be happy to answer these questions in the remaining time that we have. Uh, currently, we have, there's a question asking about um, if there's a website where people can see what we continue to do in the community. Currently, I don't think we do. Um, I personally don't. Um, I, all of the stuff that we do in the community um, will basically be uh, what you can see on either housings, uh, YouTube, housing, all of housing, social media accounts. Uh, and if there is anything that we continue to do after this, that's probably where you will find it. Um, Carly McAdams, how did, long did it take to film these series? Um, I actually have my calendar right in front of me where we actually marked the, the start date and, you know, the finish. I think it was a collective of like three months from start to finish, but like the planning started honestly in the beginning of 2020. I think uh, we were talking about it probably from the very, you know, last days of January and we wrapped it up uh, somewhere around the end of May. Um, obviously, we hit a, a roadblock when um, COVID happened because we weren't able to meet as often. And um, we actually planned for Rock Bottom to be a uh, three season, three part, uh, I don't even know, it's a trilogy, I guess, but. Um, we had to shorten it down to just one, and uh, I think that that was good enough. I think that it allowed us to kind of focus in uh, on what was really important and move from there, and I, I hope that we have opportunity to do more. Um, Daryl says, great docuseries, and is wondering, will there be any follow-up episode from the healthcare provider and emergency shelter service perspective. Um, I would like, or I would be curious to see what the conversation looks like from within the homeless service sector. So that is actually really good because we planned on putting that into one of our, uh, our episodes when we had it as a, a longer series, but we never really got the chance to do so. Um, I would really look forward to doing something like that uh, if we actually have the chance to uh, here in the near future. So, um, Daryl, thank you for uh, asking this question. Uh, so, we did do one. Um, it was kind of an off-season series, but we did film and went there and captured everything. Um, so, if you um, look at the link, I just um, answered it to you, your question. Um, you can find it there. We did about the Kaashi, um, and I think that was a very um, touching as well. They work really hard, and they put a lot of time into what they're doing, and they're super, super empathetic people, and we had a, a really good time when me and Ryan visited, but yeah, um, hopefully, um, I think we would love to continue this um, right now with the circumstance, like with COVID and stuff, and, you know, budget-wise, um, it's just very difficult, but I think that it doesn't have to be us. It doesn't have to be us at all. It could be anyone. It could be anyone who wants to tell a story. You should do it. Anyone can do it. And you don't have to use a video as a platform to spread this awareness. You can use Twitter, you can use Facebook, you can write a story about yourself. And that's the point of this documentary is that it doesn't stop you. It, it begins and it starts with you. And you can do it. You can take action on your own um, with whatever capacity you can do. So, so there's another question for you, uh, Axer. Uh, Ginger wants to know what inspired us to do the video on all viewpoints. Um, okay, I will go first. Um, so the pitch um, I did, um, it wasn't at this uh, during the pitch. I didn't really thought about this. This was something that me and Ryan 
discuss for over maybe two months. We were going back and forth and we were trying to figure out a puzzle because it was really difficult because the complexity of homelessness and being a government is a it's two very different entities and it's very difficult to puzzle these together. So we had a lot of discussion. We spent hours and hours talking about it, figuring it out, mapping it out, and we had to erase the whole entire um, whiteboard many, many times till we got to where we were like, hey, this is, we're good to go. Um, but first, it was just about trying to break the stigma, and we were trying to figure out how can we break the stigma? What, do, what can we do? And we talked about how government holds a very privileged power. Privileged power, therefore, for a regular community members, we feel like it's so prestigious that we can't even reach to them. We, we don't, voice don't even get heard. This is a often comments that a lot of communities make. And absolutely, but what people don't see is that what happens behind doors. People don't advertise these things. People don't say much about these things, um, especially in the government. Um, they don't disclose the information that they're working on. So they're not completely ignoring you. It's just that they're putting their action where their mouth is, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think because of those separation and division against those privileged prestigious organization versus community, it's no longer like communicative, you know, it, the communication just doesn't reach to the people or each other. So our way of trying to get all the viewpoints is to trying to show that government hears you, but not just that, but hey, community members these uh, there are people out there doing different things, people that have completely different opinions and different experiences with homelessness. Um, so that was the, I guess, result of why we decided to do this and to not completely be more task oriented. It's like, oh, if you have a question, you have to find an answer. The, the, the answer is homelessness there are millions of answers. There are millions of variables and it's just, everything is just way too different. And that is the reason why everyone can grow their creativity and maybe everyone can contribute to try to think for a second and maybe have an idea, uh, not just let handful of people taking care of this problem, but we take responsibility and finding what the, you know what we can do together so also uh but we're wrapping it up here uh, we have about five more minutes and actually probably gonna have to cut it shorter than that uh so that we can get ready for the last part of today but uh this is our housing pamphlet um addressing homelessness together and i think that that is uh something that really kind of sums up the the all viewpoint uh, method that we were kind of going for because it, it takes all of us together to uh, really put an end or solve the, the, the issues uh, of homelessness. But um, there are a few more questions we're going to try to like wrap up really quickly. Uh, do you plan on doing any documentaries on the lives of homeless children? That would be a, a great idea. And I, I, if I could, I'd get started on that today because I, I think that that is probably uh, really insightful and, and you know, I, I appreciate that suggestion, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and it seems like Asher agrees. Uh, but the the last thing that we're going to answer today has to do with it says uh, homeless sweeps. It said when did when and why did HPD stop doing uh, homeless sweeps? Uh, it doesn't seem like they're doing any more. Uh, is it due to COVID? So the last sweep that. Uh, or the last time, so basically we had the census, 2020 census. Um, I think this sweeps were suspended due to the fact that we were trying to count, uh, which is known as the, uh, what service-based enumeration. And so obviously sweeps were were, were uh, 
we didn't do sweep spin because we were trying to uh, get an accurate count during the census. And I think the last, um, it was the Kea'u, Kea'u uh, Park cleanup. And that was another time where um, there was a, a sweep that happened as well, but that was also um, part of a larger cleanup where a lot of, I think, I don't know the exact number, but it was like some tons of uh, trash were removed from the area. And so those are the last two, um, I guess, that I remember about sweeps. Other than that, um, there's a question about safe zones. I know that here where safe zones are frowned upon just because, you know, it doesn't necessarily create a, a healthy environment for those involved. And I understand, you know, why it was, um, was, it was asked is where they do not arrest or ticket. But uh, to my knowledge, safe, safe zones here are just frowned upon because, you know, it just does not create a, a safe, contrary to the, the name, environment for those involved. You know, it just kind of like pushes them off. So, and, and oftentimes they're forgotten about in these safe zones. And so that's all the time that we have today for uh, this session. Um, please join us in the final session of today, the closing plenary. Um, you can find that by going back to the conference uh, website on our housing, the conference site on our housing website, and clicking the link to the closing plenary. We thank you all for uh, tuning in and sharing so that we can share with you our passion. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate. Uh, we never expected to have this much people in our panel and giving us such a great um, feedback. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. I hope you guys can uh, get the link, uh, got the link, and then hopefully you can share it to other people and then make it more publicized. Um, that would be the goal. And yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We really appreciate you guys.